area that I have, have found interest in in bringing the teeth together in establishing the bite has been, of course, into the area of the laboratory technology. The focus of our program is going to be in uh, uh, these five areas. Mainly, I'll give an introduction. It'll take a little few minutes. Uh, and I'm going to cover the 10 fundamental keys to occlusion. We're going to talk about how to determine the orthopedic position before restoring the case, the importance of stabilization, which I find is really very critical because most doctors, as we recognize, are very anxious to rush to the next step. And then when to grind, when not to grind, preservation of form for optimal function. And then at the very last, I'll have a little small segment on the use of instrumentation to quantify the quality of the cooler restoration. I think throughout the program I'll be presenting some of that as what I do. The things I'm going to share with you, I believe you already know. All right? I was very nervous at the same time anticipating my anxiousness to be able to meet you and to get to see you of uh, what amazing group and organization uh, the American Academy of Creation of Fame have put together through uh, Richard and David. All right? And uh, to come to see you uh, is much more dynamic, if I can say. To see the people rather than just a, 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 a name, a logo name. But to see you here uh, is a great honor for me and, and my pleasure. Stabilization with an appliance and thirdly applying the microcousal principles nathologically. Everything that you learned in dental school is now when you apply it. Okay? We bring everything that we've learned in the past. We don't junk anything out. All the things that you learned from the great speakers that have come before you, you apply in a prudent way. And then, of course, we do a phase one. I call it a phase one basically the stabilization phase. The patient has complaint. You would like to stabilize the patient in that first phase before you consider any finalization if it's necessary. If there's a need to uh, transition that bite because you recognize that weaning that case does not work and the patient comes back and is, re is coming back in pain because they recognize that jaw relationship was important to them, then we will then consider moving into either an orthodontic phase or restorative phase or a combination of both depending on the situation or they can maintain themselves in a semi-removable appliance. Conservative dentistry is really very key not rushing to quick judgments. From a forensic standpoint, oftentimes, we see a lot of fingerprints that were put on that case. There's a lot of remnants that were placed there. You see all kinds of restorative dentistry, orthodontic type dentistry. And the last, one of the things I, I recognize and I tell our students, keep the fingerprints off the crime scene. And we'll cover uh, Lori's case uh, later, okay? A clue of restorative cases. Here, something to write down. Characteristics that identify a challenging a clue of restorative case. You have flat protrusive tracings. I'll tell you what that means. A flat protrusive, that means when the jaw protrudes forward, there's going to be a jaw track that is very flat. It should be basically as the lower and third teeth are gliding down the lingual of the upper maxillary teeth, there is, there should be a kind of a down down and out, just, you know, uh, tracing, not flat. But those cases that are flat, guess what? More challenging. Number two, anterior open bite tendency case. I'm not saying necessarily anterior open bite. I'm saying a case that has anterior open bite tendency. That means that even after jaw surgery, it might look like the bite is closed, but if you don't understand what to look for and how to find it, guess what? That type of anterior open bite case is a walking potential time bomb for a restored dentist. Severe joint laxity type case is very difficult. When there's joint laxity, you lay the patient back, the jaw drops back, try to check the lateral dispersive movements. There is no canine guidance. When the patient sits up and their, their teeth now bang forward a little bit and they go left, right, dispersive movement, now they're hitting on the canine or something else. There are different lateral paths that can occur with joint laxity cases, very difficult. Class two, division two, richer inclined maxillary incisors. Protrusive tracing. Here's the habitual CL. 
patient tapped your teeth together because it's sad to view, and the jaw protrudes forward. Why? Because you have the origin overlap. As the jaw protrudes forward, it lets the jaw relax back. If you have the tendon, you begin to see a, what we call a neuromuscular trajectory. That means that the muscles are now guided based on the neural stimulation with the tens. That means that you have the actin and myosin protein filaments are now at optical cross region to create a tens. But that's not the full story. That is a classical story from the neuromuscular doctors. But if you begin to protrude and you wait and you let the jaw hold out there for a few seconds, but you repeat this not just three times, but multiple times, all of a sudden you see a breaking up the engrams and you might begin to see a different neuromuscular trajectory with the tens on. Another different scheme again. That's where we get into what we call optimization. And that's something very, very new. Very few have begin, uh, have been recognized as, but we have seen that within the performance arena with athletes. Now here is the flat habitual protrusive. Teeth tap sap, protrude the jaw forward, typically the anterior open bite or a very little amount of anterior disclusion. Guess what? The posterior teeth are not doing the disclusion, but you don't even always recognize that because the patient doesn't tell you that. These type of cases are the ones that have usually, guess what? If you don't have proper overjet or lap, these are the cases that have unresolved pain here, unresolved pain at the cervical neck, unresolved shoulder pain, unresolved zygomatic pain, and temporalis pain. You've gotten better, but better by increasing the bite or putting some kind of appliance in your mouth. You've gotten better, but if you did not have a proper overjet or lap in your appliance, guess what? The patient does not resolve completely. Hear me out. <laughs> I'm telling you the story. That's true. If you do not have proper overjet or overlap in your appliance, even if they get removal appliance, functional appliances, or your cranial bridge dentistry, or the dentistry, when the patient's a narrow bow posted, guess what? You'll have unresolved pain here, down the neck, shoulders, zygomatic, and temporal. 80% improved, yes, but was it gone? No. Then you have to ask, why is that? I ask this even to the neuromuscular colleagues, okay, because they have often tagged themselves as neuromuscular doctors, right? Neuromuscular doctors, you deal with neural muscular problems. And I say, hey, if you understand the neuromuscular problems, how can you get resolve that problem? Because there's something wrong in the occlusal philosophy, in the nathology. See, we have to blend both the nathological concepts and the neuromuscular principles together. It's basically doing dentistry. It's a, it's a convergence of those factors. 